That is fine. Okay. Um, with the faculty meeting this morning, I didn't have time to print out. Goodness, now that is a mistake because that is due on 28th. That is Friday the 28th. All right, I didn't have time to print out the, uh, the homework for homework nine, but it is on Blackboard, so it's not like you can't uh, start that. Um, let's see. So let's see our announcements. So homework eight is due today. Did everybody turn in homework eight? Might want to do that. Um, homework number nine. Homework number nine is your uh, column and bean column assignment. There's only three problems, but that doesn't mean start it Thursday night, especially for you folks who are also in steel design, because you also have a homework due uh, that Friday. So make sure you're pacing yourself. Um, it's online. It's due April or uh, yeah, April 28th. I will provide hard copies on Wednesday. Um, what I'm doing today is this. So here's the notebook. Okay. Um, we have every printout distributed, uh, other than you know the remaining homework solutions and whatnot, uh, in the notebook. Go through it, check it. If you're missing anything, let me know. Okay, but you've got, uh, but everything should be there. Now for the exam, uh, the final exam. Uh, just like in steel design, I figured it would be a good idea to um, make sure everybody's on the same page. And here our exam is on Monday. Okay, so Monday, May the first. We start at 10.15 a.m. We go to 10.15 to 12.15. That's, that's our schedule. Um, on uh, April 28th, we will have our exam review. Okay, so, so everybody's clear on the 28th. You, provide, you turn in your homework nine. I give you the solution. We discuss the exam. You come in Monday, take it. You're done. Okay, so sound good? All right. Uh, so in terms of the schedule, this is where we're at uh, for homework. We've already turned in homework seven. We've already turned in homework eight. Um, so we're, we're rocking and rolling, okay? I, that's what I just said. I didn't have time to print it out this morning. So, All right. It's, it's on the board, though. I said I'll, I'll, I'll distribute it on Wednesday. Uh, between, between getting all the exams graded and getting stuff printed out, I just, I just didn't have time. I had to take the L on that one. Okay, sound good? Any questions? Then let's continue on with columns. Um, we did, uh, if you recall from last time, we did our square column problem. Was everybody okay with that? Did anybody have any questions? That is the same thing. That's when you, uh, you don't have room, so you just type columns. Okay, let me start. Uh, let me start here. Okay, so for columns, just so everybody's uh, clear, uh, your capacity is essentially your theoretical capacity of the concrete adjusted by two things: alpha and phi. Okay, alpha is not a factor of safety. Okay, so that's not what it's for. Okay, you tell me what's it for. What is alpha for? <sighs> Not at an angle. You're close. It's an eccentricity. If your load is eccentric, you've got more load applied on one end of a column than the other, so there's a higher stress on one end. So we reduce that capacity to account for, to count for that effect. It's not a factor of safety. Our factor of safety is the fee value. That's what phi is. Phi is accounting for uncertainty. See, a factor of safety, that's what it does. It accounts for uncertainty. We know what alpha is accounting for. It's accounting for uh, intended eccentricity. While it may, you know, in effect, you know, while it may act as a factor of safety, that's not what it's for. Okay. Um, we, we discussed uh, basic requirements for cast in place columns, reinforcement ratios, practical minimum column dimensions, even though that's not a requirement. Um, we discussed requirements for tied columns, you know, on tie size and, and, and tie spacing or tie uh, uh, bar spacings and, and so on and so forth, um, and also limits on uh, longitudinal bar spacing. Um, but it's time now to discuss uh, circular spiral columns. Now we have uh, cast in place spiral columns. Uh, the, the spirals have to be at least uh, number three bars or larger. And the clear space in between the spirals has to be between one and three inches. So two inches is very common. 
We did this problem here, and then um, uh, it was time to discuss uh, uh, circular columns and a, and a little bit of um, little bit of a, a additional requirements, if you will, for, for spiral columns. So when we look at tied columns, uh, what ends up happening with tied columns when they fail is the first thing that happens is the concrete that is uh, outside the core reinforcement will fall off and crack off. Then the longitudinal bars will begin, uh, begin to buckle. But with spiral columns, what happens is the cover uh, spalls off and cracks off, but the longitudinal bars and the concrete core are confined by the spiral and they remain intact and give you a little bit of uh, added warning and give you a little bit of uh, uh, additional response. Now for spiral columns, you know, we've got to determine whether or not the spirals are providing sufficient strength, okay? So here's how this works, okay? So I want to uh, introduce, some, uh, uh, introduce some notation, okay? <coughs> Now, um, first off, the shell strength. So if we look at A sub C, A sub C uh, is the core area. So um, what I'm going to do is relate that to the required amount of spiral strength. Now let's be clear what's happening. These spirals are circling the column like this. And as you apply load to that core, I mean, what's happening to the spirals? They're experiencing this internal pressure, right? Does that make sense? That if I'm loading this column and I'm loading that core, the spirals are keeping everything together. So they're being subjected to this pressure wanting them to burst out. Does that make sense? Well, that's a lot like this scenario right here. I have a thin walled pressure vessel being subjected to uh, uh, an external load that's causing a pressure inside the vessel. Um, we can determine the, per the required percentage of spiral steel to ensure that we don't exceed our, our required amount of uh, our available amount of hoop strength. You all did these types of problems in Engineering 216. I know my folks did. It was a, a combined loading uh, problem that we did somewhere near the end. I'm fairly certain that you've done that in other sections of Engineering 216. It's a very common topic uh, in the course. Sound good? So essentially what we're going to do is utilize that analogy and solve for the required amount of uh, reinforcement. And the idea, uh, the idea is this. So if we determine the capacity of that core and set that equal to the amount of confinement that the spiral reinforcement is providing, we can solve for, for rows to best. And rows to best is the spiral reinforcement ratio. Basically, it's telling us how much spiral reinforcement that we need. Now, if you go through and do the math, you get a constant of 0.425. ACI says, what the heck, and just round it up a little bit. So if we meet that spiral reinforcement ratio, we've provided enough spiral reinforcement uh, to, to confine that core. So your required spiral reinforcement is 0.45 times the quantity of, well, FC prime over FY, and then the gross area divided by the core area minus one. Everybody okay with this so far? Now, to compute the, uh, the reinforcement ratio, well, it's pretty straightforward. It's the volume of a spiral divided by the volume of the core. Now, let, let's be clear. The spirals, they go down like this all the way down the column. So if I look at one particular chunk, one particular uh, component of this spiral, like one revolution, if you will, or one ring around the column. What would the volume of the spiral be? Well, it would essentially be the area of the spiral times the circumference, right? Does that make sense? That if I'm thinking about the volume of reinforcement around one revolution, it's that area times the circumference. Does that make sense? So if I take the area of a bar pi times the diameter, the diameter being the diameter of that core minus a bar diameter because I'm going half in and half in so that I get that central distance, then that's the volume of a spiral. Does that make sense? Now the volume of the core in that region is just the area of that circle times the depth. And across one, uh, one spiral, that's pi d squared over 4 times that s. So that'll give us the volume, bless you. That'll give us the volume 
of the core, so volume of the spiral, volume of the core, that's our reinforcement ratio. Make sense? And then from here to here, that's just a little bit of algebra. Yes? That, no, I, I see what you're saying. We're just conservatively assuming that that's part of the core. You, you could, I guess you could subtract that, but that would arguably change this limit uh, as well. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I guess there's a little bit of a length to it, but not much. We're only, again, we're only talking about two inches over a column that might be 24 inches in diameter. So, yeah, you could probably up that by a certain percentage, but not much. Sound good? Okay, so we're going to define, uh, or we're going to find the design axial load for uh, this column shown, and we're also going to determine whether sufficient spiral reinforcement uh, is provided. So I think you're going to find this is pretty straightforward. Now we got number three spirals spaced at two inches. Um, let's see what else. We have seven number eight bars as reinforcement and we have one and a half inches uh, of cover. Now uh, we have a, a column that is 15 inches in diameter. So uh, and we got 4 KSI, 60 KSI uh, for our material properties. So let's go ahead and and go through this. I think you're going to find, like before, this is pretty straightforward. Man, 68 pages. 69 pages now. That is. Example 18B. Okay, so let's write down some column parameters. All right, so we have FC prime is 4 KSI, and we have FY is 60 KSI. Now, we have seven number eight bars. So what is the area of steel reinforcement going to be? No, that's a number nine. Oh, no, that means we got to look that up in our beam charts. Well, you remember, do you all still have your beam chart? There we go. But the cake does. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It do, the, cake, it, the cake doesn't lie. It is the lie, yeah. Although it wasn't in here because there was cake. <laughs> and A sub S, that is 0 0.11 inches square because that's the area of a number three. All right. I, I can't do anything about that. Okay, now let's do the design capacity count. Now, what is uh, phi and uh, alpha going to be? Yes? Because it's a number three. Well, that's a number three. Well, I mean, we, we can calculate, I mean, we can go through and say. Well, what's the diameter of a number three? Eight. 
And what is that? Yeah, remember, a number 3 to a number 8, the diameter is always that number divided by 8 in inches. So if it's a number 5, it's 5 eighths of an inch. If it's a number 6, it's 6 over 8 or 3 quarters. So. I didn't try and trick you there. What Now, what's phi and alpha? Where are we at on that? Point seven five and point eight five. Remember, see circular columns, they behave more efficiently than square columns under large compressive loads because they are confined better. You do get a little bit of a benefit in your safety factor and your eccentricity factor. So uh, that's nice. Now, uh, in order to compute the capacity of a column, we're going to need its area. What's the area of this column? In other words, what's the gross area? There we go. See, we sort of skipped that cap last time because it was just a square. It's just 16 times 16, so we kept it simple. What do we get for this? We'll say two decimal places. All right. Now, how many of you all did not write the little inch mark for the inches squared? No. I don't think it's going to be that bad. <laughs> okay, VPN. VPN is phi alpha 0 0.85 fc prime ag minus ast plus bless you fy ast and then you just start plugging and chugging so 0 0.75 0 0.85 0 0.85 times 4 KSI times, now what AG was 176, 0.71, C minus, that plus, ST, 5.5. Say it again. Second on that? Do I have a second on that? Yes. Okay. Again, don't don't shortcut on your units. Make sure that you're writing it out. I'm telling you that that right there would have brought the, the, the exam average up a good three or four points. That right there. Okay. You know, I'm just going to focus on VPN. All right, does everybody have all this? All right, I'm moving on. All right, um, we do have one more calc we need to do, and that's um, 
the, the spiral check, it's 18, right? 18B. Okay, and that's... Uh, Okay, so in order to determine our, our uh, whether or not we're, we're uh, providing a sufficient amount of spiral steel, um, we need to do some, uh, some fundamental calculations first. The first thing that we need to uh, compute is our core diameter. Now our core diameter is just the uh, original diameter minus a cover on each side. And what's the cover on each side? Nope. 1.5 inches. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> now we're going to calculate the area. As long as it's consistent. the same thing over and over again. That's right, squared. And it's not 5 or 4 times 12 squared, or yeah, it's 12 inches squared. Do I have a second on this? Okay. Now, here, everybody follow along with me. So here, here's how this is going to work. The first thing that we are going to compute is rho sub s, which is the actual amount of reinforcement that we are providing. Now we compute that uh, as follows. 4 times a sub s times the quantity DC minus a bar diameter, or no, no, sorry, D sub S, sorry, D sub S, okay, S DC squared. Now again, all this is doing is taking the volume of the spiral dividing by the volume of a core. That's all this is, yes. That's next. Well, that's a good question. D sub S is the diameter of a spiral. What is the diameter of the spiral? Three-eighths. There we go. So this is 4 times 0 0.11 inches squared times 12 inches minus three-eighths of an inch divided by, now what was, what is S? Two inches times 12 inches squared. Yes. What do we get when we plug and chug? What are the units on this? No, no, hold on, hold on. Well, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Scarberry. What are the, There you go. That's right. There are no units. I'm going to add one more decimal place and say this is 7, 8. Now, we are going to compute the minimum allowable rho sub s, which is yes.
So what was the gross area again? And this is 113.1. What do we get here? What? So wait, wait. What did you, what? <laughs> He's not even <laughs> Hold on, hold on, say it again. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. All right, w are we good? We have more reinforcement than is necessary. Not bad, right? This is simple. Yes. Yes, you need to be careful on that, though. I mean, uh, even adjusting it a quarter of an inch or even a half inch could make this limit fail. That, that's point one. Okay. Point two, number threes at two inches is a very common increment for spiral spacing. However, that common increment is contingent upon using 4 KSI concrete and 60 KSI steel. If you're using different material parameters, that might need to be adjusted. More often than not, it will need to be adjusted. So, the spacing, um, hey guys, guys, come on. Numbers. What? Like the spacing on spirals, whole numbers. Typically, yes. Typically, yes. All right, everybody good? Any questions? Yeah, but keep in mind when we use spirally reinforced columns in this manner, I mean, we're talking about confining columns for things like earthquake loads and what have you, so it needs to be. We need that confinement in, in those instances. Make sense? Yeah, so, so we're not talking about like run-of-the-mill columns. I doubt that they probably use that on parking garage over here. First off, memory serves those columns are square and we don't need to deal with those types of loads uh, around here. Good point. Make sense? Okay. All right. Well, if you understand that, then I think column design is pretty, pretty simple. Um, so here's, here's how column design works. Um, you start off by determining your design axial load. So you say, all right, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, what have you, to get your factored load. Now, to design, to, to appropriately design a column, here's how it works, okay? You need to guess a reinforcement ratio. So it's got to be between 0.01 and 0.08, unless otherwise noted, a good starting value is 0.02. Um, then you'll solve for your required gross area, okay? Now, when you solve for your required gross area, and you pick a column size, you can't just say, well, we'll take that column size, multiply it by 0.02 to get the required area of steel. Because what ends up happening is this. You'll get a column that's 17.2 inches, so you'll round it up to 18 or something like that. Now you've got a different column size. Well, if you've got the size of the column and you've got your load, you can solve for the amount of steel that you need, so you don't need to use this good starting uh, assumed value. Luckily, the, the equations are, are already derived and they're pretty simple. Uh, once that's done, check your details. Uh, unless uh, it's otherwise stated, a, a good cover is uh, one and a half inches. That's for, for most uh, uh, typical columns, 1.5 inches is, is a good value. That's what we use for beams uh, as well. So let's take a look at this. So to determine the required gross area of the column, it's, it's pretty simple. Here's the expression for the uh, capacity of a column. 
Well, the area of steel, that's just the gross area times some reinforcement ratio, right? Well, if I assume a reinforcement ratio, let's say, of 0.02, the only unknown variable in this, assuming I've got my material quantities uh, known, is AG. So I notice I got an AG here and an AG here. I can factor all that out. And since this expression has to be greater than or equal to PU, I can solve for AG, and there you go. So dependent, so based on, I guess I should, based on a load and an assumed reinforcement ratio, I can solve for the required area of the column. So if it's a square column, I can take that gross area and solve for what would the sides need to be. Or if it was a circular column, I can solve for what the diameter needs to be. And then I can say, all right, if the diameter needs to be 13.6 inches, I round that up to 14. Now I have an actual column size. I take that actual column size and I say, well, if I actually know the gross area and I go back to this expression, now that I know the gross area, now the only thing I don't know is AST. So plug and chug, solve, and there you go. So again, don't take your gross area and just multiply it by 0.02 but because once you solve for the gross area, you're going to more than likely round that up to the nearest inch or the nearest couple of inches. So your gross uh, area is going to change. Okay? Does that make sense? That's not bad, is it? Okay, so we've got two uh, design examples coming up, uh, 19A and 19B. We're going to take our time with those. And then we're going to have interaction. And then that's it for reinforced concrete design because after interaction, we're done. No. <laughs> There's a couple more. There's a few more things. See, see, we could get, we could do some really crazy stuff. We could do strip and tie analogies where we take a beam and turn it into a truss and and, and pick the reinforcement that way. That gets that gets weird. We'll talk about that later. So that's all I got. <laughs>